Good evening and welcome to this special Q&A, Me Too. I'm Virginia Trioli and here to answer your questions tonight, lawyer Josh Bornstein, who specialises in workplace cases, including sexual harassment. Columnist Janet Albrickson, who's concerned that Me Too is promoting a social media mob. Singer Isabella Manfredi, who's spoken up against sexual harassment in the music industry. And Macquarie University professor Catherine Lumby, who conducted pioneering research around sexual harassment and culture. Please welcome our terrific panel. And we'd just like to acknowledge that Charles Waterstreet, the barrister, was going to be part of this panel tonight and he had to withdraw and he withdrew last night. Now, Me Too, as you know, has swept the world from Hollywood to Canberra, mm -hmm. where today, in the wake of the Barnaby Joyce affair, the Prime Minister announced a new ministerial code that bans ministers, whether married or single, from having sexual relations with staff. Me Too has resonated with women around the world and with the permission of our audience, we'd like to show you why. So first, can I ask all the women in the audience, and we have more than 50% here tonight, can I ask all the women to stand up, please? Thank you. Now, if you're comfortable doing this, could you, if you've been harassed or even worse, could you please raise your hand? And it's fascinating, that's clearly the majority and most of the young people have not raised their hand for whatever reason. I think that shows just how many of us are affected. Please sit down, give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> as you can see, it touches so many of us and there's a lot to talk about tonight. So as we settle back in our seats, let's get to our first question from Joseph Zeleznikov. Hi. As a 17-year-old male, despite all the news on the matter, I'm still unsure of where exactly the line is between being flirtatious and committing sexual harassment. And how am I supposed to deal with that? The eternal question. Mm. Kathy Lumby, can you help? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with flirtation. And I think there's a mythology that, you know, feminists want to, and, and men who call themselves feminists, want to strip all the fun out of life and out of the workplace. That's not true. Sexual harassment is the knowing abuse of power. It is unwanted sexual attention and it's usually persistent. Uh, and I think when you're flirting with someone, you need to be pretty aware of the cues they're giving you. And I think perhaps we need to work much younger with young people on education around these issues to assist them because certainly most men do the right thing. Isabella Manfredi, generationally you're probably closer to the uh, questioner than anyone else on the panel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, is this a generational uh, question? Does it have, does it have a particular aspect to it? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's got a lot to do with what kind of relationship you have with the person, whether they're in authority or whether they're a colleague or just a friend. Um, I think it's got a lot to do with trust. and. Um, you know, it doesn't take much to check in with somebody and go, you know, if what I'm doing at any time makes you feel uncomfortable, I would really like you to let me know and, um, you know, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, so if I do, um, I'll apologise and try and amend my behaviour. And that's what happens between friends when, um, and good, you know, good healthy relationships all the time. So I think bringing back that sense of... Um, you know, and a bit of common sense as well. Josh Bornstein, can I get the lawyer's view? Oh, look, the lawyer's view is pretty clear, and that is that the line is very big and bright and loud, and it's the line called consent. And so uh, the law essentially says it's illegal to harass someone sexually, uh, and that means that the conduct is unwelcome. So, of course, uh, picking up on what uh, Catherine and Isabella have said, a lot depends on communication. Um, usually it's pretty clear when someone doesn't want the attention. Mm. It requires people to communicate with, with each other and men in particular to be very conscious of both explicit uh, no's and uh, more subtle signs as well. Janet Albrechtson, is the line very clear? Um, I, I wish it were clearer, I don't think. Um, I think because human beings are complicated, um, relationships and uh, interactions are complicated and human sexuality 
is complicated. I think it therefore um, is much murkier, unfortunately. And so if a, if a man or a woman chats up uh, someone else, uh, it could be sexual harassment if you don't like that person because of the way that we've often defined sexual harassment. And you can go back to last year's um, Australian Human Rights Commission report on sexual harassment, and it was defined as being a stare or a leer, telling a joke or asking um, a question about someone's personal life. Now, that's very broad. But on the other hand, if someone chats you up and you like it, then it's just flirtation. So it is, you know, it, it's pretty hard, and it's, it's hard for men, it's hard for women, and it's especially hard if women are not more explicit, I think. It's very hard to expect um, someone to pick up what's in your mind. And even, it's especially hard if you're not clear what's in your mind. And let's not pretend that we're always clear when we're meeting someone and talking to someone and getting to know someone. We're not always clear. We haven't always made up our mind. But after the fact, to say, well, I wish you'd picked up on my, uh, my non-verbal cues, I think that's really, really difficult. I remember being told to us once, Josh Bornstein, by um, a complaints resolution officer at the Equal Opportunity Commission in Melbourne, that um, harassment was uninvited, unwanted attention of a sexual nature. So if you want it, you'll never get it. <laughs> is it, does that, is that too defined now, given what Janet's been saying about the way it's been interpreted by various institutions? The difficulty I have with um, Janet, in one sense I agree, of course there can be uh, a blurred line and poor communication and nuanced um, complex behaviour. Having said that, I don't think Me Too is about that. I have never had a case of sexual harassment, I've got a pretty busy practice in that area, about a clumsy misunderstanding. Usually we're talking about patterns of behaviour, persistence, mm. um, a refusal, pretty clear refusal to accept no verbally in other ways sure. until yep. it starts to affect the health of the person. Mm. And uh, so it's a bit like workplace bullying. Often workplace bullying is repeated and repeated mm. until health starts mm. to, to fragment and the same with sexual harassment. I, I accept that, Josh, absolutely. The problem is that when you move away from the law, as we are doing increasingly, and we're putting claims out there on social media, and we're claiming whether it's sexual harassment or violation or whatever, that's then, where it gets we'll, really and tricky. We'll get and that. we will, of course, yeah. talk about We'll that. get to that tonight. So our next question now comes from Sophie Cusworth. I experience sexual harassment approximately once a fortnight. It ranges in severity from catcalling to men thrusting at me, filming me or touching me. The perpetrators are diverse. How do we ensure that the Me Too movement engages with men on this spectrum of sexual harassment and combats the broader culture of entitlement without alienating men who do not fit the villainous Weinstein archetype. Josh, I'm, I'm going to start with you because um, you are our only male here on the panel tonight. <laughs> it was not our intention, but that's what we've ended up with. Josh, engaging men, but, you know, without sort of uh, tarring them all with that, that Weinstein brush. Look, I think one of the things that Me Too has already achieved is I think men have to think a bit more, have to reflect a bit more and have to be a bit more cautious. So that's the first thing that it's achieved. But if it's going to have a lasting impact, then I think we need to look at addressing gender equality uh, from, from cradle to grave. Um, Emmanuel Macron in France has come out, I'm not generally a great fan of his, but he's come out and said this is a huge issue and problem in French society. It's not just a workplace problem. It starts at home, it starts in schools, it's on the streets, people are being Certainly sexually harassed in streets. Um, I, won't, I won't comment on that just yet, but, um, uh, but it has to be attacked globally. So we can have law reform, but we need to look at the whole box and dice of gender relations yep. and gender equality and um, try and narrow the can gap. I, can I respond to that too? Um, you know, we've got this fantastic audience of young people, high school, students in here and it's fantastic to see them and I did uh, research in New South Wales high schools with 13 to 17 year olds and they consistently told me that in sex education they get a lot of information about biology and they kind of get the same information at primary school and th right throughout high school. They're, they're in no doubt about how to do it. They're, they're in no doubt about how to do it <laughs> and some of them are doing it but, and good for them. But <laughs> 
<laughs> but, um, but what I would say is that they were very clear that they would like more information about communication, about how do you know when there is consent. And a lot of sexual interactions are negotiated non-verbally. And yeah. so I think if we can start yeah. education earlier and give young people an opportunity to speak to each other, not just be lectured at, mm. to talk about how they, how they communicate, how they have those conversations, whether it's on social media yeah. or offline. But the question specifically went to engaging men on this issue, and, and that's the work that you've done, and you've done that with the NRL, one of the blokiest cultures going around. <laughs> yes. So can, can you engage men without alienating them, and can you change thinking and behaviour? Yes, you can. In fact, we've got research. I've done two large research projects at the NRL. I'm about to, to start a third one. And we've measured attitudinal change, which is what drives behaviours. Um, and those programs are based on real-life scenarios they face, and it's about getting guys in a room together with an education facilitator and talking through complex scenarios, because some of them have grey areas in them. Mm. OK. Well, let's move to our next question, and it comes from Anya Ristik. My question is for Isabella Manfredi. Um, so you've had the courage to speak out about the abuse that you encountered. How would you say that this has impacted your career and the way that people treat you in the music industry? Well, th I think the biggest thing for me about the Me Too movement was that it gave me a chance, and my post gave me the chance to not only have conversations with other women, but to have conversations with the men in my life that I had never been able to have. Real, honest conversations. And there was something about the Me Too uh, movement which, just because of the sheer depth and breadth of the stories coming out, it gave a legitimacy to um, an experience which up until then seemed, for whatever reason, to not have a legitimacy. And that stopped a lot of conversation. Uh, and I think for me the best thing was just being able to talk to my band, honestly, about what it is like to be a woman in the music industry um, and with my management and with people at my label. Uh, I don't want to talk for you, Isabella. Do you want to speak about what happened to you and, and, the, and what you described in your post about being leered at and touched up? And well, I don't want to go into too much detail about it because I, I, I really tonight want to focus on the positive proactive solutions and um, most of what I experienced was in America um, and that's not to say I haven't had uh, personal experiences of, of abuse um, but I think you know mostly it's like the, the 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 hands up the skirt or you know unwanted attention you know just right up there like <laughs> Ooh. Um, uh, and you know from from people that are in uh, you know, big companies that uh, when you're a musician, you're like, well, these people are either paying us to play or they're, you know, they're really the gateway, the gatekeepers to... They're in charge of your next record release. Yeah, whatever. So, you know, it's, it's really hard in those situations to go, hey, you know, you just, whoop, you know, uh-uh. <laughs> um, Is that what you do now? That's what I do now. <laughs> because, because the fantastic thing about this, this, this whole, you know, and I know we're going to get to the, the legal, you know, the murky legal aspects of it and the performative aspect of it, which I, you know, I, I have my own thoughts about, but I think it's been a really positive thing for women to share their stories as a, a, a a collective. And what's changed about your, your male band members' experience or how they apprehend this issue and whether their behaviour or attitudes have changed as a result? Well, I think it's been really difficult, and that, this goes back to the question before this of, you know, how do we engage yeah. men in the conversation, is that men, uh, you know, I think f for women in these positions, it, it has been... Um, you know, a lot of these things happen in private and it is a, it's a private space. Uh, and women on the whole, uh, and any victims of abuse really, uh, bear the responsibility. They bear the brunt of the responsibility for that. And I don't see myself as a victim. I've always put my head down and kept working like a lot of the women who've come forward in positions of power now. Um, but the, 
the greatest thing is to lean forward to men and go, you know, we really need you guys to take some responsibility for this as well. That doesn't mean that it's your fault. In fact, fault and responsibility are two different things. We seem to equate them with the same thing in our society, that for some reason taking responsibility means accepting blame or accepting fault. In fact, it doesn't. The true meaning of responsibility means to respond to a situation, mm. to be responsive. It might be the lawyer's fault, I think, that when we'll get to that, Josh. <laughs> um, um, but, yeah, I, I did, but I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it's been a watershed for me. It's I want to ask Jan Albrechtson on this as well. I mean, it, it is the, the thorniest part of this discussion, which is engaging men and changing behaviours and not alienating them as part of a pretty difficult conversation. How do you do that? Um, well, you would have included, uh, Charles, you know, Charles Water Street would not have come under pressure, for example, from the Bar Association to come on. Because these kind of voices are the ones that need to be part of the conversation. We can't, as Isabella said so eloquently, we can't just hear from the women. It's a conversation that has to be had with everyone who's involved in this um, because it is so murky and because my experience will be different to Isabella's, from Catherine's, from Josh's and Virginia's and all of you. Um, none of us is right here uh, necessarily and if we come together and we can actually test and hear each other, I think that the Me Too movement will get to a much better position. I think the passion and the energy in the Me Too movement is fabulous when we're engaging and we are checking on where it's going and what the aim is. So I think that you have such a positive attitude about it, Isabella, is fabulous, and that you're talking to men and women about it is great. Yeah. But when we start excluding voices, as, you know, as happened here tonight with mm. Charles Water Street, I think that's really sad. You know, my concern has been um, pretty much when it first started, there was this very quick hardening of orthodoxy. I mean, for goodness sake, Hollywood had been silent for years about this, and then all of a sudden they were all saying the same thing. And if you diverged from that in the slightest way, you were, you know, hounded down as if you were a female, you were hounded down as a traitor to the movement. If you were a bloke, if you were someone like Matt Damon who put his, you know, poor head up last year and, and spoke about a spectrum of behaviour, well, he's recently apologised and basically said, I'm, well, he literally said, I'm going to now shut my mouth. No, we, we actually want people to be engaged in this and I think that's where I get concerned about where it's going. Can Did I? Jump in there, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead, Josh. Oh, can I just add my two bobs on that? Um, I think... Me Too properly looked at is a protest movement and hmm. a protest movement led by women who are whistleblowers. Whistleblowers working with investigative journalists calling for major change. You are not going in any situation like that whether people are protesting about abuse within the Catholic Church of children hmm. or um, banking scandals. You're not going to bring everybody with you. You're not going to bring every uh, Neanderthal man with you. We have to accept that there's going to be abuse thrown back at people who, who want change. That's always been the lesson of history. And yes, we can try and engage and we should try and engage, but we're not going to always get people mm. to agree and, and or can support, I just... support uh, progress <coughs> in gender equality. Yes. Can I just say as well, Janet, I, I agree with most of what you said, which is I never thought I'd say that in my life, but I agree <laughs> with most of what you said. But um, I would say that, you know, uh, drugging and raping 50-plus women is wrong. There are, there are people in the debate who are wrong. Yeah, oh, and, of course. And, and of course. It's, I mean, we're talking about... We're really talking about the spectrum... The Me Too movement started by calling out real apex predators. No really. one. I, I haven't you heard know, a single person who has said that rape is right, okay, yeah, in this yeah, debate. And, and we're right, both... So let's be very clear about yes, that. Yes, very Kathy clear. Lundy? Yeah, can I add something? I mean, I think, coming back to the, the watershed moment of hashtag Me Too and Josh's point about it being um, really a huge protest movement, I see it in the same terms as I saw the early second wave feminist marches uh, where women, you know, got in their overalls, and I still proudly own a pair, by the way, I've just carbon dated myself on national television. <laughs> um, and they I think I did that before with the generational reference to Isabella <laughs> McFred. He said, don't worry about it. And they took their placards. And what's happening now, what's fantastic about social media is that it's allowing women to, uh, to speak out with a collective voice. Yeah. Because in the past, women told their stories in single file. They told them to colleagues. They told them to friends. Yeah. They told them to counsellors. They told them to lawyers and sometimes to the courts. 
Um, that said, I agree with Janet that we need to be very careful about it turning into a mere trial by social media. OK, well, let's, uh, you are watching a special Q&A on the effect of the Me Too social movement against sexual harass harassment. And our next question comes from Leanne Bowden. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm one of those old-time feminists, by the way, um, 70s feminists, and so I find it very hard to believe that so much of this is is going on. Um, but I've heard lots of women in this um, argument mention the reasons why so many women have gotten in trouble with, with men, and also it goes to a bit of the consent thing that you're talking about, is that they are too polite to speak up. I find that hard to believe for, for a start, but however, if that is the case, my first question is, how did that occur from when I was, you know, coming out? I'm, I've never been sexually harassed, um, thank God, and I don't really know why, maybe because I'm stronger, but it may be because I know how to speak up. And how then do we rectify it and get young women to speak up, now, and not just online, but actually speak up to the man if they think that they're about to harass them. Because as I, I for one, uh, have always done that, I guess, and that's why I've hardly had anything happen to me. Maybe. Leanne, thanks, for, thanks for your question. I'm going to go to Cathy Lumby there. Um, what I'd say, Leanne, and you know, thank you for that question, um, and I think it's great that you feel empowered to speak up, but I think at the heart of sexual harassment is power and abuse of power. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's probably not OK or easy for lots of younger women in, in multiple different workplaces to speak up, partly because they're scared of losing their jobs. That's mm. an important part of it. Um, what about, you know, the girl at the local cafe who's trying to get away through university? Um, very hard for her to talk, to talk up to the boss, speak out to the boss who's feeling her up, you know? Very difficult. So I, I don't think we can just say it's completely up to women to speak out. I think what we need to do is look at the pro policies and protocols we have in place in our workplaces. Uh, and I also think we need a national conversation about this, if not an inquiry, which allows a dialogue about cleaning house, if you like. Because one thing is organisations are now on notice that if they harbour predators, their brands yeah. will be damaged. Mm. And that's what matters to them. Um, can I go to you, Janet Albrickson? Do, do you share Leanne's disbelief about what um, she sees as many women just feeling unable to, to swat hands away? Yeah, I, I think part of the sexual revolution should have been that we feel more empowered to, to say, get lost, F off. That's not right, you know. Um, and I think it's a shame that we don't. I understand that there are circumstances that make that very hard and, you know, the power dynamic makes it very hard sometimes. But, um, you know, I remember uh, in, in the midst of... Uh, oh, at the end of last year, I think, listening to a Slate podcast, and these are, you know, three women who would not share my politics, um, let's be honest. But they said, what is it that we want to get out of the Me Too movement? Do we want more laws, you know, so Josh can make some more money? Not particularly. <laughs> we might want better laws, but it's not always a case of wanting more laws. And these three women, all three of them agreed and said, no, d you know, I just, I don't want you to protect me. I just want to feel that women are more empowered, that this should be the long-term goal of the Me Too movement, that they are more empowered to say, mm. get lost. And the more women who do that, I tell you, it gets easier and easier. And I think when we step yeah, and away the more men and we and we're able to actually call out the behaviour as well. Yes, I mean, know. you know, Helen Garner raised a really interesting point this week um, um, about, you know, if if you as a man are seeing someone come in and behaving in a lecherous way, at what point is it your responsibility mm. to say, "Hang on, mm. you know, please don't do that in here. That's not appropriate." Well, the, the issue of women's agency mm. is, is a really interesting one, and we have a question on this from Catalina Quintero Serrano. Does the celebrity catalyze movement only trivialise the issue because it portrays women as vulnerable? And that goes to that point, doesn't it, that we're discussing here about... And I'll bring you in here, Josh, that... And, and a lot of women have uh, uh, rebelled against, and we saw this in the, the, the French anti-Me Too letter, mm -hmm. where they resented the idea that women were somehow presenting themselves as, you know... Uh, uh, was it Margaret Atwood said as well, as, you know, wilting Victorian flowers. Mm. We'll have some strong views on that here, but Josh Bornstein... So I'll start with my strong view. So I have a difficulty with uh, that wave of 70s feminists because, in my view, they're guilty of a failure of imagination. 
by which I mean they are unable to imagine someone who isn't robust and able to exercise all the power that a Deneuve or a Greer can muster mm. and tell someone to rack off. People are complex, as you said, Janet. They come in all shades of uh, resilience, robustness, and they're in a society which, generally speaking, is unequal when it comes to men and women. So uh, to put all of the responsibility on women who are often terrified of the consequences, for good reason, with sexual harassment, because what happens when they do complain, I see when they stick their head up, mm. they get it kicked off. They get driven out of the organisation. And that has economic <laughs> consequences. actually go back to, to Leanne, uh, Leanne Bowden and your question, because th that's a direct challenge to you, a failure of imagination to actually take yourself out of your evidently very strong mindset and to put yourself in the mindset of a woman who ain't quite as tough as you. Uh, I, yeah, I do, I do agree and it's funny because I, I was... I, I did, did, didn't believe all these things could be happening and then, I wasn't going to mention this, but I had a female relative who was sexually assaulted, that's all I'll, I'll say. And that, of course, suddenly made me... That's what made me came up with the fact that she she was assaulted by a good friend of hers. I've had hundreds of male friends and male colleagues who have never done anything like that. And it is hard for me to put mm. in my mindset that this seems to be happening and more these days. And, yeah, how do we rectify... How do we get women to speak up and how mm. do we get men to listen more, more like... Cos they could seem to be on both sides Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Leanne, thank you. Um, Cathy Lumby, I'm going to come to you mm. because uh, Josh made the point about it, it being a failure of imagination, but of the, of the aspects, of the, the two sides of the debate, actually, that really need to come together in, in, in order for anything to really change. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, mean, I think, look, you know, Josh's point was very important. I mean, if you look at... I, I was... I, I did a law degree many years ago, and my graduating class was the first graduating class at Sydney University, which was 50% men and women. Now, I recently did some research with a couple of colleagues into where the men and the women are now, and I can tell you that the women have not risen to the top in the way the men have. If we look at corporate boards, if we look at, at our governmental institutions, um, you know, we look at uh, um, in universities, anywhere you want to look, the media, and you know about this well, and Janet knows about it well, and I'm a former journalist, you know, it's incredibly male-dominated still. And I think that that's also part of the problem because, really, it's about prioritising this conversation. Mm -hmm. I think hashtag MeToo has brought it to the fore and I think it's time for our institutions to clean house. Isabella? Well, I think the MeToo thing was really about women wanting the, the privilege to be heard and understood and believed. Um, and those women, you know, the 70s feminists like Greer and, and Atwood, um, incredible minds and uh, women that I look up to. Uh, but, yeah, they, they came from a period where sexism was entrenched. It was our society. Uh, and they knew that to, that to combat it, they had to be faster and smarter and tougher. And my generation, I mean, I grew up in co-ed schools and, mm. you know, then a single sex school, being told boys and girls are totally equal and, you know, you're a smart, young, talented woman, the world's your oyster. Go for it. You know, you, there are no limitations to what you can achieve. And was the reality a shock or did it a pan little, out well, largely it just, that way? It just starts to it, it, it sort of, in subtle ways, you just kind of go, oh, uh, what's, am I, am I... <laughs> going crazy here, you know, especially if you don't think of yourself as a victim, mm. you don't have that mindset that you're, that you, you know, you're not interested in, no one's interested in being the face of sexual harassment. You're interested in being the great songwriter, the great performer, the mm. great manager, the great, uh, um, you know, agent or whatever it is in my mm. industry. Uh, and you're sort of going, whoa, wh why did that feel so weird? Or if you get, you know, a hand up the skirt, and it's, you know, maybe you're at a... I'm just, just riffing here. Just, but <laughs> maybe, maybe you're at a, you know, state business dinner and the guy that's sitting next to you puts his hand up your skirt and his wife's sitting next to him. Highly hypothetical. 
totally hypothetical. <laughs> what do you do? You know, mm. Um, mm. In, in before Me Too, would you be believed? Would you be seen as a, as a drama queen? Okay. Probably yes. Well, that goes to, to Josh's point about what the Me Too movement actually represents to you and where it's going. But I just wanted to briefly come back to you because this is your bread and butter and you deal with these cases all the time. Can you paint for us a picture, a, a generalised picture, if such a thing is possible, about the, um, the journey that a woman goes on when she comes to you with a complaint of harassment at the workplace? How does it generally go? By the time... A woman comes to see me about a sexual harassment case, the first thing that I'm always prepared for is her health will be severely compromised. So, um, and in fact, this is an issue for people who have traumatic experiences of work, and there are a hell of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. We spend more time at work than we do at home. So the whole gamut of human experience and drama occurs at work. But a woman who's suffered sexual harassment and who's got to the point of booking in to see me will be very, very distressed and traumatised. It's only a matter of degree. So I spend 10 minutes um, giving le uh, medical advice, even though I'm a lawyer, um, and making sure if they haven't already done so that they've got a GP and at least a referral to a psychologist. The other thing about um, the journey is the journey can often be um, over in three months and usually no one knows about it. It's all under the radar. Right. Um, if I have someone coming to see me because of sexual harassment in a law firm and I press send on the letter of demand, for example, in the legal industry, I can then set my clock and uh, wait for the response and it'll be like lightning. And cases like that are over reasonably quickly um, and with confidentiality. So. In one sense, that's a good thing for women, and women in that situation often want confidentiality. Mm. So it's very complex. I'm, my first duty is to advance what they want. Yep. On the other hand, this is going on all the time, no one knows about it, and that doesn't assist mm. the the broader That's policy right. issues. Yeah, and, and Me Too is about actually lifting that veil. Well, um, our next question actually goes to what goes on in workplaces, and it comes from Shelley Smith. In the hospitality industry, it sometimes feels impossible to report or defend yourself from those in a position of power above you. I work in hospo and have been verbally or physically or sexually harassed or assaulted at every job I've worked at. If you make trouble, you can lose shifts. You're already underpaid and they make you feel like you should be so lucky. <coughs> the Me Too movement is great, but it also centres around rich, mostly white, mostly straight women. Mm. How do we fix it when we're already so exploited and powerless? Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from all the panellists on this. I'll, I'll start with um, Cathy Lumby first. Gee, that's a good question and it's one I've been <laughs> reflecting on. That's why I... And this might... I hope this doesn't sound too airy-fairy, but that's why I'm saying I think we need a national dialogue. I think we need an inquiry. We need to, I then think, mm -hmm. out of something like an inquiry, look at what kind of recommendations uh, would, fo would flow. And it could be an ombudsman. Um, we know the Human Rights Commission um, takes complaints on sexual harassment. The reality is it's a very underreported matter uh, and women don't feel safe coming forward. So that's why I also go back to starting young with education so that young women know their rights um, and feel empowered to act on them. Mm. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up... I mean, we, we, we haven't even really begun to hear the stories of the LBGTQI community. Which is, you know, it's going to be another... I think that's going to be a whole other reckoning. Janet Albrickson? Um, I think you're absolutely right that it is a, a rich person's uh, train, if you like, the Me Too uh, movement. And, you know, for example, um, this week recently we saw horrendous reports coming about, out about child rape in Haiti um, with Oxfam. We've seen similar ones in Africa and, you know, sometimes I think the Me Too movement needs to get a passport because there are these kinds of things going on around the world where we don't really hear it enough of. That's not to devalue when someone is genuinely um, assaulted um, or violated and certainly raped. But, you know, there is a lot going on that I think as women in the Western world that we could uh, be part of a discussion because if, if, if we don't shine the light... Then, then who on earth does? And you see where, example, uh, for example, um, 
you know, a men's only dinner in London at the Dorchester Hotel that employs 130 hostesses uh, gets far more attention. So to me, it's a no-brainer which, which one is more egregious. I think you'd probably say by the end of this week they've probably had equal coverage. I mean, that's been a, a, a blanket I issue, hope there's as much outrage, Virginia, uh, about Oxfam and um, people working within the emergency um, parts of the United Nations as there was over what I saw as a pretty non-event at, you know, at a black tie dinner. But, you know, we'll wait and see. I, I'd like to bring in here, if I could, Kristen Hilton, who's the Commissioner for the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, because um, this is your... Unfortunately, your daily work, your bread and butter, what's your perspective on this, particularly to the question of how, how work, simply turning up to work and working safely and happily can be achieved in the hospitality trade and other industries too? Well, first of all, I mean, it's terrible that someone should undergo that sort of treatment when they turn up for work. And unfortunately, Shelley's story is all too common. We see it daily at the Commission, particularly in industries like hospitality, retail, manufacturing or agriculture, or where the cultures are particularly male-dominated. Emergency services is another one. Since the Me Too movement, we've seen a 40% increase in complaints at the Commission, and I think that's a positive thing. I think it means that women are more prepared or trust in the process a little bit more. Um, we're also seeing more inquiries from uh, employers, so them saying, how can we create a culture where, in the first instance, this doesn't happen, so it goes to that prevention, but also, if it does, how do we have good systems and processes in place so that people, if they speak up, don't feel like they're going to lose their job yeah. or aren't going to get the shifts or... Get, uh, get fired and then don't get the reference. So that idea that women don't speak up or don't report or don't complain because there are consequences, that is a real, that is a real thing. I'll go to Josh on that, but just before we leave you, um, we had many great questions tonight and of course we couldn't get to all of them, but one of them went to the significance of all of this and the casualisation of the workforce. Mm. So when you're a casual and you have even less authority uh, and less standing in the workplace. Is that a big issue we need to take account of? It is, of? and that's because often that environment is less regulated and so your power base feels even shakier. Yeah. Um, and so people will move from job to job and yeah. and I think there are there's a vulnerability there attached to the casualisation of the workplace that becomes more prominent. Josh, can we just briefly hear from you just some reflection that, that might make sense to someone working in this hospitality industry? Uh, yes, it's a fantastic question. And one of the only things I can suggest is to join the union um, because hospitality workers, young women working in hospitality are, as everybody's noted, in a really vulnerable uh, situation. How, how effective can that union actually well, be? Well, the problem at the moment is unions have been delegitimised and demonised in, in our society. And at the moment they're suffering an existential crisis of incredibly low membership. Until they rebuild um, and until people start to be encouraged to join unions, um, we're going to have some really gross exploitation, both economically but also in terms of sexual harassment and all the other uh, difficulties faced by vulnerable workers in that industry and in some of the other industries that uh, Kristen has mentioned. So, um, and I know at the moment United Voice, which is the union in question, has put together an app called Rate Your Boss. And mm -hmm. one of the ways um, it's encouraging people to address underpayment and sexual harassment is for them to, to rate their experience working in a particular organisation. Now, you're not a defamation lawyer, but are there any issues there that, that might, be, <laughs> might be raised? Um, there may be, but... Uh, and I, I can't go to advice I've given that union, but... Um, Generally speaking, it's quite difficult to defame an a company. An organisation. Yes, as yeah, you may know. Right. It's, it's more problematic with individuals, yeah. but uh, organisations Just before, before we move, Shadow you will have a very different view to, to Josh's on this, I'm sure. But is, what a direct advice would you offer for someone who is working in that, in that hospitality industry? I've worked in the hospitality industry, so I can tell you firsthand that um, anyone who has worked, you know, most people who have, mm -hmm. um, will, will have experienced it. Yes, indeed. Um, and and no, I guess, yeah. you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we... But each of us will react in a different way. So, you know, for example, when I was working as a waitress um, going through law school, I just knew not to go in the call room. You know, mm. I just knew not to go in the call room when there was a certain person. So there are, you know, there are unfortunately ways of managing it uh, that doesn't make what's happening right. 
Um, but in the real world, you know, a, a, as, as a young woman who just wanted to get on and work and, you know, do my four or five hours and get my money and get the hell out of there, that's what I did. What if it's your job to go into the call room? Well, of course it was my job. But I just knew not to go in there when, when there was a particular person, Josh. I mean, okay. it's just like there's, you know, a little bit of common sense sometimes. It doesn't make it right. I'm just saying that is how I manoeuvred it. Well, now, I guess common sense is, you know, not popular. Sure, but, um, but we're talking here about having to, I guess, have, creating a society where we, we don't have to second guess or sort of arm or prepare of ourselves course. for the monsters. Yeah. Um, Isabella? Yeah, I, just, I mean, it just goes back to that whole thing of, uh, of the weight of responsibility being, um, you know, borne by women. And um, uh, having to alter our behaviour on another's behalf because they're... They're, they're behaving inappropriately. But I'm just saying that was mm. one... You know, there are oh, many yeah, no. ways of coming at this. Yeah. You know, one of them is the Me Too movement, one of them is having conversations, one of them is including men, not mm. saying to Matt Damon, you need to shut your mouth. You cannot be involved in this conversation. Mm. You know, if men don't feel part of the conversation, I can tell you the problem is going to get far worse. I can see cultural change from the time when I was in a, in a, in a restaurant in Adelaide or in a law firm in Sydney mm. as, as opposed to now. So it's not like cultural change can't happen. I happen to think that there is a role for both men and women. And if the Me Too movement can em empower women to stand up and feel that it's OK to say, rack off, I think that is a very good thing. I think it's going in all sorts of other directions, unfortunately, Kathy, but that should be the focus. Yeah, and, look, I mean, I've shared Janet's experience. Try, try cleaning tables at Pancakes on, on, the, on the Rocks at three in the morning when you're bending over a table, <laughs> um, you know, and some drunk guy put his hands up my skirt and um, they sacked me when I complained. So, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying poor me, I'm saying that a lot of women have had this experience. Um, so I think we've got to go far beyond women just having to avoid um, situations. I think what has happened now, though, is it's very likely that organisations, um, larger organisations at the very least, are going to be called out collectively. And that is the power of hashtag me too, that women will feel that they can come together, whether it's through a union or whether it's through social media, and name and shame places which are really hard for them to work. Yep, OK. Uh, our next question comes from um, Aidan Carter. The Me Too movement was initially created in 2006 by social activist Tarana Burke as a means to promote empowerment through empathy for women of colour experiencing sexual harassment. Mm. How can we ensure that this campaign is inclusive of all forms of diversity going forward? It's a conversation we're just having there, I guess, in a sense, about, you know, it started, of course, as you say correctly, Janet, as a, as a very privileged white conversation, but it doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. Josh Bornstein? I, I, I'm a bit more generous about Me Too. I think it has given voice and encouragement to people from all industries. Well, to be fair, to we, ha we have seen Me Too protests in, in many countries. Correct. And countries of colour right across the world. Correct. So. And, and the women in the... Um, the media industry and film industry are very conscious that a lot of them, not all of them, are, are well paid and conscious that uh, there are people in far more difficult economic circumstances, mm. different mm. people of different background, people with less power, less influence, less prominence. Mm. They, they are, for example, in the, the US setting up organisations which will help women from r right across all the sectors all backgrounds. So I think actually Me Too is having a far more positive and broader impact than some people might suggest. Mm. Well, inappropriate sexual relationships, of course, seem to be everywhere, and the Joyce affair is uh, clearly consensual. But today's announcement by the Prime Minister puts the focus on Parliament House in Canberra. We're wondering if we all need a code of conduct for us in the way that the Prime Minister has announced a code of conduct. <laughs> You'd probably say that's sexual harassment law, Josh Bornstein, the code of conduct. Um, <laughs> What has happened today is panic. First of all, it's panicked, hmm. a panicked response, and hmm. I think detracts from the Me Too movement. This is about consensual relationships. My view might be totally out of line, is that consensual relationships are perfectly OK at work. I don't have a difficulty, despite uh, some of the issues with Barnaby Joyce, He's had a consensual relationship with a 33-year-old woman who 
has is perfectly able to decide. Even if it's a direct report, I mean that. that yes, that... I, I even in that situation, um, think it's perfectly okay. Oh. Where you have a difficulty is where the, the subsequent issues that has involved Joyce is where it gets murky. Sure. But the response to ban, mm. ban mm. bonking as they call it, um, <laughs> the, bonk bonk, the bonk ban, the bonk ban is it's a hashtag. Is a gross <laughs> over. <laughs> it is. It's and. We saw fun. this. We saw this, of course, with the yes. AFL, uh, not that long ago. Well, when, that's right. When they yeah. publicly shamed not only the men, the women, their families, and sacked them, not, in my view, because uh, they were having uh, consensual sexual relationship, it's because they were worried about mm. brand damage and social yeah. media. But this is where we're going. You know, this is where I fear that this very fast fault. train... Well, there's a lot happening, Josh, almost on a daily basis now. You know, and I feel like we've got, we're on this very fast train and we don't quite know where it's going to go. We don't know whether Finally, it's going to derail. Finally, we've got a very fast train in this country. OK. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about the only one. It's, it's the only one. <laughs> right? This last week, and I, I looked at what happened in the U.S. Congress, so the, the, the um, House of Representatives voted unanimously. I mean, they can't agree on a single thing, but unanimously yeah. they agreed to ban consensual relations. Let, 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 I thought this is not going to happen. Let me here. jump in here just to um, irritate Josh, maybe. But um, I know that there are workplaces, Kathy Lumley, and you've probably been involved with them, where this simply is the code of conduct. Where when you have a direct report, where you have a, a line of authority and power, see people nodding their heads, nod your heads, where you, they, everyone knows in the workplace you can't have that relationship. This ain't new. Well, I, 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 the way I look at it is this. I work in a university. Now, um, we have codes of conduct, very strict You'd ones. have them wrapped around your head. Yeah, wrap absolutely, <laughs> and so I should, um, <laughs> about uh, sleeping with your students. That used to happen when I was at university. That it, Now you would get suspended from your job. And I, it doesn't matter if it's a PhD student who's the same age as you. I think, um, you know, that's not OK. At the very least, if it's, say, it's someone your own age and it's consensual, then you would have to recuse yourself from supervising that person. I also think that um, it's very much up to the senior person to recuse themselves from line management yes. if something develops. But the reality is, as, as Josh has said and Janet said, um, a lot of people meet their partners in the workplace. Um, Me. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. I'm guilty. And, it happened. Yeah. And, and, and it happens, and we spend a lot of our time at work. <laughs> and, and, Catherine, you know, for the Prime Minister to say, oh, nothing good can ever come from this. You know, uh, yesterday I received so many emails from people saying, well, I, you know, married um, my husband or wife and they worked directly under me. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been married for 35 years. So to say that nothing good can come from this... And remember, there's a baby too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's oh, plenty yeah. good that can come from this. And I think this notion that Malcolm Turnbull is setting himself up as, a, as the morality police... I mean, how do you enforce this? Do we have a grandfathering pr provision for those who are currently in a relationship? <laughs> you know, transition? We're all in trouble. Can you imagine... Uh, yes. Can you imagine... Uh, what would happen to the halls of the ABC if the bonking ban... <laughs> Watching, would would there be anybody me. left? I tell you, I tell you what bothers me about it is that <laughs> it's inevitably though going to do over women, because the men are largely going to be the managers and the women will be the inferior. And so therefore, if someone has to move on and be moved on from that line mm. management position, she'll lose her job and she has to mm. move on. Yeah. Isn't that going to be the absolutely. case? Absolutely, mm. absolutely. This is gross overreach and it has nothing to do with me too. And, and it, can, can I say very sorry, quickly? Yeah. Can I jump in very quickly and say, look. You know, we're talking about abuse of power when we're talking about sexual harassment. If we're talking about consenting adults and things are safe and consensual, I don't think we should be bed sniffing personally. Mm. Here, 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 here. That's a bit graphic. I've heard that phrase before. <laughs> Our next now question now comes from Zephyr Ograk. While we need to laud victims of sexual harassment for speaking out in light of the Me Too movement, but now we are seeing trial by various mediums, including social media. If these allegations are so serious, why aren't we seeing them being tested in a court of law or having law enforcement act on them? 
It's a very good question. Um, we'll go to you first, Janet Albrechtson, because this is one of your pet concerns. Trial, trial yeah. by Twitter. Yeah, it is. And, you know, the law is not perfect. The law is a difficult thing to manage. And, and as Josh mentioned, if you are the victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault in the workplace, um, you know, going to a lawyer, thinking about going to court, even a mediation, that, that's pretty daunting. So the law is not perfect. But then to go to the other extreme, which I fear that we're doing at the moment with trial by Twitter, and it's very easy because what you do is, you know, this is this social media is, is fa fabulous in so many ways, but it's also very polarising and you can hang out with a group of people that all agree with you. There's no one really who's going to, you know, if you choose, who will test what you're saying. So you can there, you know, launch your prosecution online. You can be the prosecutor, you can be the judge, you can be the jury. That's, that's my concern about where we're going. We're seeing it increasingly. And so you have to work out, well, the laws are not perfect. Trial by Twitter is very imperfect. You know, there are still these principles that it was better for one innocent person to go free than for one, um, um, sorry, for one guilty person to go free than one innocent person to go to jail. Those kind of principles, the presumption of innocence, the reason we have the rule of law. I mean, the rule of law matters because law is basically order. And if you don't have law, then you have anarchy. So what we're seeing online, I think, is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit um, anarchist, I think, in, in its sentiments. And I think it's dangerous. The other thing I think that it promotes is this sense just that... Just this sense that... Every time a woman says something, she has to be believed. But if a man says something, we can't believe him. And, I, again, I think that is a, an inversion. If we were to turn that around gender-wise, as women, we would be up in arms about that. Yes, but that's only been for four months since the Weinstein... <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make it right. That no, but it's it nice right. to get a little bit of parody. You know? <laughs> it's nice jo to... Josh Bornstein. We, you know... In terms of sympathy at the moment, I've got more sympathy with the thousands of women who've experienced unavenged rapes. I've, I've got more, more sympathy... And you with, don't think we do, Josh? With, well, I mean, that's a well, cheap shot, where, right? Well, where, where, as, is as the sympathy, where is the sympathy and the op-eds and the passionate uh, advocacy for women who are epidemic, in epidemic proportions mm. suffering domestic violence, rape, for, who, for which there is a shockingly low successful prosecution yes. rate. Mm. Domestic violence kills an extraordinary number of young women in particular. Sexual harassment complaints are going through the roof and other sexual misconduct continues to plague us. So at the moment, there's a protest action. It combines whistleblowers, people who are blowing the whistle on a huge and ugly part of our, of our society combined with some brilliant investigative journalism. Those things are both very important in our democracy. I am not... I don't agree that the rule of law is threatened. The rule of law is about having independent judges who basically curb abuses of power by government. This isn't a question about the rule of law. There's no law that says every person who sexually harassed has to go to court. I can tell you about a court case that everyone will know about in which... Um, Peter Slipper was accused of sexual harassment. And after years of prosecution, his health being trashed, millions of dollars in lawyers' fees, his reputation trashed to uh, the nth degree, it was just pulled. Was that the triumph of the rule of law? I'm talking about Twitter. I'm, I'm juxtaposing what is happening on Twitter and social media platforms. Mm. And, Josh, you have also... I mean, it's not that you just act for women, you know, who, who come to you um, with complaints of sexual harassment. Yep. You know that the union movement, like any other workplace, yep. also has claims against it for yes. sexual... And you have acted for those, for the unions, in those circumstances. I've acted for people and accused of sexual harassment uh, No, 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 but you've well. also acted for unions yep. where women have come... Um, yeah, yeah, think, yeah, I think I'm you have. Okay. Yeah, you, I think you'll remember that you have. All right. OK. <laughs> so when you, you... You know that in, in, in a court case there are two sides. You've yes. acted for the person against yes. whom a complaint has been made. Yes. That's part of the deal. And in those circumstances, you know, there are lots of things that happen that we don't like. There's a lot of slut-shaming. You know, there are a lot of problems with, with the law in terms of when a woman comes to court. And so okay. if you are acting for the other side, you then know, the don't always defamation. pretend you're... The law of defamation. Yeah. Well, let, let, let's yeah, let's bring in Cathy Lumby here. Yeah, well, look, I mean, you know, I'm a little torn because I agree with Janet that I am concerned that if the hashtag MeToo movement continues and stays where it is, that it does become trial by social media. 
I am concerned about due process. But I also agree with Josh well, I am, uh, uh, you know, about the fact that, you know, this is, the, this is the overpouring of anger and outrage. I mean, I work um, pro bono uh, with Rape and Domestic Violence Services Australia. I mean, if, you, if there are any of you who know the statistics about, you know, two women a week are killed by their intimate partner in this country. It's, domestic violence is the lead, leading cause of death and disability among women aged 18 to 35. So that's domestic violence. Rape is the least reported crime. Mm -hmm. And when it is reported, the court systems fail women again and again. And with sexual harassment, they even if there are laws, a lot of women aren't accessing it. Well, I, I, so, I want to jump in there no. because we, um, one woman submitted a question today. We had a particularly painful uh, question submitted today about how difficult the legal process can be based on her experience. And I met her before the program and she's had an awful time. Uh, I won't go through the entire story, but she's tried everything she possibly can to get this man, um, a, a direct manager, from harassing her. Her doctor advised her against asking her question here tonight, and that goes exactly to your point. Yep. Uh, her, her health and her mental health was yep. exactly in the place that you described. Doctors, Josh? doctors say don't prosecute rape cases. They, exactly. Because okay. it's, and, and people that I spoke to for a book I wrote a number of years ago on this call it the second rape yep. when you go through the trial. Yep. So how can we make the legal system less traumatic, uh, less expensive and uh, fair, taking Janet's mm -hmm. point, and I absolutely agree with it, fair for everyone? Is, is there a path that you can see, um, Josh, and is it being ignored? There's no magic fix, but we need to look at the laws and processes around rape cases because there is an appalling problem there. Mm. When mm. so many women uh, complain of rape and who are deeply traumatised, there's no doubt about that, and are then being told by their doctors, I've acted for some of these women, don't you go don't do near it. a police prosecution, your health will be shot and your chances of success will be something like... 10 or 11 per cent. You have a 90 per cent chance of failing that case and you'll be re-traumatised for the next two years. Mm. When it comes to sexual harassment, I think there's more that can be done. Um, we need ridiculous time limits of six months that exist in the federal system to be removed because a lot of women don't come forward quickly for all sorts of reasons. We need caps on damages lifted. Um, a debate needs to be had about confidentiality, but one thing we can do about confidentiality is force organisations who face sexual harassment complaints or deal with them to at least report those, that data to a central agency. So there are a range of things yep. can be done, but I think mm -hmm. it's not just a legal question, as Janet said earlier. This is a much bigger part of our society, which involves education, which involves economic power, as well as the law. It could yeah. also be, um, Josh, you know, I've spoken to some people and it could be who've been involved, you know, personally. Yep. And it could be less adversarial. Yes. You know, you could move to the French system, which is more prosecutorial, yes. mm. possibly. Agreed. I mean, I don't know. I that's agree, that's an enormous that issue. issue. That work, work, be yeah. work better? Yeah, I think the adversarial system's terrible in this regard. Um, I, and I do think that, in fact, the European system is a, is a much better system in terms of an inqui inquiry... For these kinds of cases, yeah. 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 Um, so, well, man, Freddie, can I ask you to, to buy in here as well? And, and I'm still wondering what an adversarial and a... Inquisitorial. <laughs> yeah, can, can you explain that to me? It's, oh. Well, I'll, I'll leave... Well, we'll do that over a drink later. Yes. OK. <laughs> cool. right. In the French it's, system, it's, it's actually a judge or, or a short, small bench of judges versus yeah. having a uh, barrister and uh, a defender and, and uh, often a jury as well. But um, is, is taking legal action, taking it further, taking those next, you know, often terrifying steps, is that something that feels ever possible and open to you as the inheritor of the, the first and the second and the third waves of feminism? As a, as a victim or as some... Mm -hmm. as, well, or as someone advising a friend? Yes, I mean, we... Uh, I, when I put my post up on Instagram, invited um, people to contact me via email and I got over 200 emails within the space of two weeks, under two weeks. Um, and, you know, quite a few of those stories were clearly uh, pro prosecutable. They were clearly yep. breaches of legality. So in those cases, um, uh, I did my best to, to consult those women on what, what would you like to do, how would you like to take this any further. Um, but it is a huge... 
I mean, it's a huge step and it goes back to that thing before saying no woman wants to be known as that girl, mm -hmm. the sexual harassment girl. You yes, know? it's enormous. Yes. It, it hangs out she wants to be known head. for, for yeah. what she's doing a good job for. We're really out of time. Let's go to our last question now, and it comes from Julia Menkaralia. If sexual abuse and sexual har harassment is as widespread and common as the response to the Me Too movement suggests, what would the panellists advise their teenage selves to, do, to have done differently? We'll try and keep our answers brief if we can, because we're right up against time. But uh, a reflection from your 12-year-old self, Joff? to intervene and speak up with other men and boys. Mm. That's a good question and I, I, you know, I'll, I'll pose it this way. It's a conversation that I have with my, and he's not 12, he's 17, but my 17 year old son. You know, or, or my daughters. Um, this is this is a conversation that we need to be having, and it is about speaking up. It's the point that I was making earlier about having the courage, and it is courage, and it's not easy. But the more people who do it, the more people who can do it. Mm. Kathy Lumby, um, agreed. And I've got teenage boys. Um, I think this is where uh, I would be encouraging that self uh, to find a trusted adult. It could be a school teacher. Mm. It could be a family friend if you didn't feel comfortable speaking to your parents. And, uh, and I think that's why widespread awareness means that, that uh, you know, young people will feel that they can come forward to someone and actually get support. Isabella Manfredi. I think I would tell my young self that that wasn't her fault. Hmm. That's a good one. I think that's what we should all tell ourselves. And that's all that we have time for tonight. Please thank our terrific panel, Josh Bornstein, <laughs> Janet Elbertson, Isabella Manfredi and Catherine London. Thank you. <laughs> and please join Tony Jones on Q&A next Monday. He'll be talking policy and politics with Josh Frydenberg, Chris Bowen, Simon Breeny, Louise Adler and Sharina Clanton. I'll see you on News Breakfast tomorrow morning. Oh, yes. And I'll be back here <laughs> on Q&A sometime soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you.